small gatherings of people, and I'm really happy that, it, uh, that there seems to be, uh, that it's starting to aggregate conversations of people around the table. Uh, just to let you know that this conversation is going to be uh, streamed uh, on howround.tv, and so if you, uh, just to let you know, if you're coming to join the conversation, or if you don't want to be filmed, there's a camera, so beware. Um, and uh, without further ado, I'm going to give you over to Andy. Thank you. Good, good afternoon, everyone. How are you doing? Good. Hey. How, many, how many people are hungover? <laughs> I'm not, because I, I, I hold. <laughs> yeah. um, so thank you all for coming. Uh, thanks to Mei Yin and Mark radar for being our partners for three years and um, I always like to I'm gonna stand here for a second. I, I don't know where uh, and I always like to give a special shout out to Mark because it was ten years ago that um, I was working for him at PS122 and I was like I really want to start a blog you know and, and, and start having conversations about the work and he was like okay you know and actually I thank MK because I got a little community engagement grant from the NPN that helped me uh, uh, pay to have the first website built of CultureBot. So thank you, MK and Mark and Ignacencia. Um, so today we're, 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 we're gathered together to discuss multiculturalism in a global context. And of course, all of that will be deconstructed and reconstructed. I just want to talk a little bit about the format. Um, it's called the long table, um, and we do a sort of modified long table. The long table is, a, is an idea that was uh, created by the artist Lois Weaver. Uh, if you don't know Lois, she and Peggy and uh, Deb Margolin uh, started Split Bridges uh, in the 80s, and uh, they're great, great, great theater makers, and uh, she has been doing a lot about creating sort of more participatory democratic forms of discourse. And so she came up with the idea for the long table We've modified it. Um, uh, the way Lois likes to do it is it's completely open um, because we tend to focus on some really complicated and naughty question, naughty, not naughty uh, questions. Uh, we like to get some invited guests to sort of join the conversation and get things going. But um, you know, feel free. There are empty spots at the table. You know, so feel free if you if you if you are feeling called to join the table and join in. Um, you know, uh, uh, the, the the etiquette guides have been handed out. Um, if there isn't a seat at the table and you feel really like you need to get at the table, you can tap someone and ask for their seat. They don't have to give it to you. Um, <laughs> and if you're at the table and you're like, you know, I've kind of like I've done what I you know or whatever, or you need to pee or you know, feel free to go and come. The idea is really that you know we want it to be a conversation, not a sort of like didactic, you know, presentational thing. Um, um, any questions? Quickly, quickly, quickly. Okay. Um, great. So let's start. Uh, I'm gonna sit next to the top. Oh, everybody's bios that's at the table, their bios are in the program, and they have name tags poking out, and you're welcome to look around, or if you wanted to sort of say, you know, a, um, but we're not going to do all of them. You can read people's bios. Hi, how's everybody doing? Good. 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 So, um, some of us have a little bit of a head start, because um, EK, Hassan, um, Koraka, and I had a little chat uh, at ACAP yesterday, after the hotel, and start talking about their issues. I didn't want to sort of like, tell everybody a little bit about like, what motivated this conversation for me to want to do it. Um, and I, it was really um, two things. One was that like, I was in um, Berlin in May for the first time for the uh, Theater Festival, which is a big theater festival there. And I was invited by the third group. And um, I was there with um, you know, people from, you know, I, I was sitting after with Megan, and we were sitting at a table with a, with a, with a, a painting guy or something, we were talking about like, gender. And stuff. And this guy with a mustache over there, you know, isn't participating. I said, Oh, where are you going? He goes, Oh, I'm from Baghdad. And like it kind of like put everything in perspective for me. You know, and over the course of the day, I was talking to people from, you know, someone who had been um, you know, uh, like a Bosnian, you know, who had survived that and was wearing the like, war dealer and meeting people from 
all of the world, and I realized that like, but also being a Jew and an American in Berlin, um, and really sort of feeling all these complicated feelings about like otherness and perception, and, and I learned what phenomenology was, which is the experience of being in the world. I mean, like I knew what that was, but I didn't know it. And it just really opened up to me that you know the conversations about multiculturalism and diversity, like actually like are much more complicated sometimes than they seem. And then there's also that thing like being an American, like in a way when Europeans come here, it often feels like um, they sort of think we're, we're charmingly naive in our approach to multiculturalism and diversity. Um, and yet, I think America, and I think there are these interesting challenges about sort of like the challenges of, of, of what diversity means in traditionally hom homogenous cultures like Western Europe or, or prestigious homogenous cultures and traditionally heterogeneous cultures. Like cultures of America. And so I just thought like, you know, it's great to get some artists and 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 and, and administrators and, and thinkers at the table sort of talk about some of these issues around sort of um, you know how how multiculturalism as a, as an idea can can work in different cultures, how the different ways we have worked in our field um, as artists to incorporate sort of negotiate the way we're read and the way we read. Um, so I just sort of thought we'd get some people together to talk about those things and share the projects that we're working on and our practices. And you know, I know um, a lot of the, uh, lot, uh, I know Nora travels all over the world, perfect. Uh, so, um, and I, I, I don't know uh, Jonas's situation. Uh, so anyway, so I just wanted to start and um, maybe see like what are people's, you know, um, you know, I don't know, why don't we, you want to pick up on what we were talking about yesterday, you guys? A little bit about um, connected thoughts and the creative case. I think that's a great place to start, it's just sort of the creative case. It's not the cozy case. <coughs> okay. Um, just to give a little bit of background, um, both myself and Nick have worked for the Arts Council in England, which is the main funding body for subsidised um, art in the UK, in England. And um, we both worked within uh, what is called the diversity team. Which is probably a bit problematic, really, because, and we found it a bit problematic because that suddenly we were supposed to do, we were supposed to do all things diverse, and it kind of <coughs> there was a tendency of the organisation to say, well, you do the diverse bit, and um, you know we'll just get on with you know the real world, you know, <laughs> funding the opera and the ballet and stuff. Um, but nevertheless, you know, you, you can't even lead in these institutions as best you can. But we found. Um, I guess, particularly in the way the world changed after 9-11, the challenges around notions of multiculturalism <coughs> and diversity uh, and equality, that we, we kind of found ourselves a little bit boxed in. Because, in one sense, what I would say was that the, 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 the right uh, began to make a running around these questions. In fact, began to redefine what multiculturalism and diversity uh, was. Uh, and not in a way that we were comfortable with. And um, we found a kind of rug being pulled under our feet, so we felt we had to respond. So we got a group of artists together and academics and so on and said, come on, let's try and redefine what diversity and equality means in an artistic context. Because obviously, you know, if you work in a bank, there may be some notion of diversity and equality when you work in a bank. If you work in uh, the school system, they have their own notion of what diversity and quality means. What does it mean for <coughs> the arts? And so we began to develop what we call the creative case for diversity and equality in the arts, which was a notion of, of, of this, that somehow the conversation becomes separated. That you had a kind of small conversation around diversity and quality happening over here, and then you had the grown-ups conversation about art, how it's made, who makes it, who participates in it, how it innovates itself, how new forms arise, how um, in the, the world in which we live today, how the rigid distinctions around art forms are going to be broken down, uh, what theatre is, what the visual arts is, what's the connection between the two of them, all these kind of questions. This is a big grown up conversation which is happening somewhere else. And we were kind of a little bit shut up from it. So we said, what we'll do is we'll park our Sorry about the military um, term. Well, part of our diversity tank on your arts law, 
So you said, what we're going to do is every question that you talk about in terms of art, we're going to talk about, but we're going to talk about it with diversity and quality in art. And when you talk about diversity, in, in human terms, we're talking about diversity in its broadest context. So it's not just about race and ethnicity. It is about gender, it is, it is about sexuality. It is crucial, I think, about economics and what we call the working class and, and those kind of issues, those kind of issues of class. Um, and so we said, let's try and create one conversation about art, but with a true value of diversity and quality at the heart of it. And the way that we put it was this. If there's a kind of, we, we believe, utterly believe, that diversity is intrinsic to the creative act. Like, in one sense, different elements come together, contradiction, new things arising, which challenge old things. This is the motor for, for the creative act. And therefore, diversity, in one sense, cannot be sidelined, should not be sidelined, because um, it's integral. It has value within the creative act. Um, so we said, we don't care whether you want to talk about um, the history of art, you want to talk about how things are innovated, you want to talk about how art we, um, uh, relates to the real world, um, but we don't care whether you want to talk about Picasso or you want to, you want to talk about Balanchine. We've got something to say around how diversity is integral to all those areas and all those, all those kind of people. And so we began to develop, and we're still developing, and today is a development of that conversation about the process of diversity and quality in art. Well, that's a great, thank you for explaining that a little bit, because, I, because that's definitely out there, I think, at the heart of this. I mean, one of the things that, two things that come up for me is one is that we have a similar problem, I think, here in the States, where, you know, uh, the, the conversation, are, like, the notion that, like, sort of, a diversification, or sort of like an integrative approach, like creative approach, is actually at the heart of most work, yeah. most creative work. Um, and um, but we we find ourselves having conversations, I think, like where community rigor in terms of like diversity work in diverse communities and aesthetic rigor, it's hard to like negotiate those conversations on the ground. And then I think with and then we and then um, we also experience you know when when I was I'm going back to Berlin again, sorry. Um, you know, like like one a curator from one of the major venues there said, "Well, we just want good work." I said, "Ah, well, okay, yeah, all right. Well, so anything that's made by your friends is good." And 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 actually having this conversation about what is good work and what is rigor, and I think um, I think that's a really uh, interesting question. Is like how do we evaluate that? And I remember when I was in Portland, Nora, and you were talking about mirrors. Um, and um, and uh, um, um, you were talking about um, your background, your 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 your, your, your dance background, and sort of like having this conversation. I was very intrigued and moved by you sort of saying like, well, people were asking you about like what sort of training and referencing Western specific things. You were saying, well, I'm not. That's not my thing. Yeah. So. Well, I, I, I think to, um, as a person who makes work and who lives through the work that you can make and also have uh, been involved in uh, in America, I, I, I think I've arrived at a point where the work is um, really competent, uh, resisting um, of what is expected. You know, I think in America, when I came to America, I was just uh, not. Uh, and quickly, I started to learn that that wasn't enough. That I was either going to be black or I was going to be African. Uh, and that between black and African was sort of my salvation. Um, you know, and I had to fit into what that aesthetically, what that was. Uh, but I had also come from the University of Zimbabwe. I studied law. I actually danced just uh, for fun in Zimbabwe. So uh, what, you uh, don't have traditional dance background? No, I don't have traditional dance background. I just dance for fun, and I was happy to do that. And so you know, going into the American dance system, which I, you know, I was very intrigued about the training, but also quickly realizing that, you know, um, Oh, it's either you do what the white uh, Americans are doing, 
which I couldn't quite understand what that was. Oh, you do what this MADA thing was, which seemed also ancient uh, by the time I was getting into it, the Grahams and the Jose Limon. Oh, you do what the African Americans had done, which was the black dance. And so all of that seemed to me kind of like, whoa, my goodness, uh, this, this is not me. Um, so I think for me, the, the question of diversity and how my work is read and all funded, I mean, it's, it's a whole in the system, right? So I have to fit into something. So I start to say, well, but I'm African, you know? And I think I'm uh, African, being African is completely distinct from being black. Um, um, and, and that uh, the aesthetic uh, is uh, not going to be black dance because I, I don't know what that is. Uh, really, I cannot lift my leg through my nose, and I won't. <laughs> um, yeah, so it's, 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 being, it's, it's actually an interesting, I think, black hole for me uh, because there are many Africans who are willing to grapple with the issue of uh, blackness and Africanness and say, well, you know, what I'm really doing is, 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 is me, no rich but all these things that have come into who I am um, make the world look like this. Um, but I need to be funded to do it. You know, so how do I write about the work? I need to be able to present it. So who's going to dare enough to present a piece like Miriam, Miriam which is just a belief, really. Um, you know, so, um, I don't know, I think what I'm learning is, um, as my friend Anadia said, who she tells me, is not to, not, to, not to be worried about taking care of people. Not to be uh, worried about being rejected by sort of the, uh, the American dance, which whatever, what, what, what is that? Is that doing most cutting up? Um, you know, or being rejected by the black world? What is that? Is that doing daily? Uh, you know, and just, you know, do what it is that I feel I need to do, you know, which is also, I am my own inquiry. I think I am really uh, very much interested in what Africa has contributed to uh, the world of art, uh, you know, and just sort of uh, stay the course with that, you know, and I think um, that then the diversity comes at this table for, you know, accepting Africa for a place of the of God. You know, well, you but 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 when you but when you see what is presented, um, uh, you know, what when you see what is funded, when you see the artists who are um, you know being written about, um, you know, you you know, and questions about what is this technique that you're using? Is there a technique? You know, is there a rigor? Is it? You know, I mean, so they are still. It's not a done deal yet. Oh no, it's good art, but I think it's, it's, it's also fundamental for art making <coughs> is that people are inherently uncomfortable with what is not known, and there, that what is not known is mostly what is diverse. There's a sort of codified idea of what a, what we can say. Okay, this is dance. You need to put dance. This is theater because that needs to be street rules. If you look at African art, you look at the statues. So even like Picasso looking at the art is always in the art, the representation of Africa in this country. But it's not so much to make, to make it about Africa. It right. just so happens that I am African. Well, no, I get, yeah. I get the point. Because I think because the point is that we talk about diversity is really, are we not asking about an other, an, an openness to look at all kinds of different forms of art and art making, and that goes back to who presents it, which is sort of the gatekeeper, who funds it, which are other gatekeepers, who makes it, who writes about it, and who who will um, be comfortable with with your presentation of you in your art or others in your art. That's what I'm talking about. I think. I was just going to raise cultural equity as um, sort of a more uh, better approach to kind of analyze this because um, the, the perspective that diversity just means mixing it up um, is too shallow an um, approach from my perspective and what you're identifying from my perspective is cultural equity. And how do we create systems which provide for cultural equity and that, 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 that there are multiple contexts that are um, available and respected and supported, and what is the framework that brings us to that circumstance? 
when it comes back to the language, I think it comes back to the language that we use. Because like you're, when you're talking about diversity, you're basically saying it's the intrinsic, it's like what you just said, intrinsic value of creating art. Whenever well, when we talk about diversity, that's often not what the people relate to. We're immediately talking about right. other diversity. Right. Right. Well, and exactly. We did brought up yesterday, and I want to revisit that. Um, I want to frame what I'm about. Um, because the word that popped up for me is complexity. But actually, like, complexity seems like a more rewarding way, uh, or, or possibly another way, because diversity is a fact. Like, diversity means like the world is diverse, and, and, and the discourse around it is simple. And, and it's about how do we have a more complex discourse and acknowledge that. I randomly came across a blog last night on Tumblr that was the history of African um, representation on the continent of Europe from like thousands of years ago. And there's actually like, you know, this person actually went through and found all of the sort of like, you know, various presence. So it's like, um, and so I want to go back to Nikkei talking about writing. And, and, and you had said something yesterday about criticism and sort of about, so I was thinking about what you just said. I was like thinking about what you work with Obi, and Obi works with Ralph, and Ralph struggles about being a conceptual choreographer when people wanted him to be a black choreographer. And then, um, you know, and then also like the French conceptualists, it's like, well, you know, I think Xavier Roy is not a trained choreographer either, and he can just be Xavier Roy. But you're having this battle where you, you have, you know, you have a, a trained lawyer. So I'm just thinking about, and, and you know, so can you talk a little bit about what the writing has been about? Yeah, as I mentioned, um, what is the Arts Council? And it's not this issue that came up around, it, it's similar to what you said about your conversation, where they said we just want to put our, always even because of the fact that it's diverse, it's not for some people. I, I, I haven't, I, I used to run a, a showcase for about eight years, and I worked quite closely to increase business and join well opportunities Artists. And what the artists would come back and say, similar to what they said around, I'm being basically judged through this very Western lens. And it was a, it was a constant complaint. And I guess when we looked at the organization, there was a number of people who made those decisions about what was good that didn't have an understanding of anything other than what we described as a Western kind of interest in this, um, the interest in this conversation. And, Something that came up a lot when we were at the Arts Council is actually how do you critique work? How do you critique work? And it goes back to things like you have to have good archives. And I know that in England, we want to be great at archives. You, know, you have to have good archives. How does anybody know what you've done? But you may have it, you know, you may have your movies or your theatre piece, your plays, you know, your great and poor, but how does anybody reference it? It doesn't exist beyond that. I think you have to have good critics, you have to be able to develop the the voice of the critic. And I think we did, we did something at Showcase in 2011 where we had critics from around the world, uh, 10 decibel as um, fellows, and they critiqued the work. And what was quite interesting is someone's critique maybe out of Kenya, maybe far more interesting to a, a critical voice that's coming out of England to describe work that may not even be Southeast Asian, it may be coming from an African context, but they get it, they get something. And it was really interesting to see the critique. That, that came through. And I think also we need to start to unpick what those kinds are. <coughs> you know, we were all taught, everybody in this room understands what that Western canon is, but how do we know about the Asian canon and all the other aspects that are out there? And actually, where is the space for people to start developing critique with new genre and new art form? I know that within the art class, we were very rigid, theatre, music, dance, and if you didn't fall into those art forms, you weren't really considered, they were all secondary, or they would link up the community, which was always seen as secondary. So I, I, for me, what's really exciting about meeting Andy last year was actually I felt, oh my God, it's always on the same page. And really what I'd like to, to see happen more is to have more discourse. I mean, we talked about this slightly earlier about there is something within the visual arts that allows for this discourse. But actually, within the performing arts, we really, can keep really on people that and talking about it and where the space is built to do that. And I think it's also really being able to value the work 
we need to start talking about that. But there still needs to be a number of things that happen alongside. And it also supports the programmer's work, the work of the creator, it supports the work also of the artist. So you're not just going into a menu and feeling like you're this lone artist doing a TikTok exercise. You're actually supported by an infrastructure that can actually help critique you, market you, do all the things that you need, increase your audience in, and all the things you need to, to survive and to grow, to grow your practice. So as we really unpack, I'd love to um, toss this back in and pay a little bit because you guys have a visual arts network. You have the performer. Uh, and just so everyone at the table, uh, MK is the executive director of the National Performance Network, uh, which was started 30 years ago? Uh, about 28. 28 years ago. Uh, and uh, is now headquartered in New Orleans. And um, was really an artist driven initiative, uh, Ava White and some other folks. Um, and, um, you know, it's been, so, I, so I wanted to sort of toss this back to you a little bit because you did talk about cultural equity. And it feels like there's like, there's, like multiple pieces to this. And um, I know you guys have visual art and performing arts, and you know you're working with Latin America as well, and, and that's become a really interesting. You know, it feels like like when it comes to sort of trying to sort of build cultural equity on the world stage, of sort of being heard, like not only allowing like the colonialists to write about colonialism, but actually hear the voices of. Yeah, so I just wanted to see what, like, hey, tell us a little bit about what you're doing, and maybe some of your thoughts on what cultural equity looks like, what are the things that... Well, um, I really add that we're also working in Japan and South Korea. So uh, we've been working in Latin America and the Caribbean for about 10 years. And um, about three years ago, we expanded our uh, global work into South Korea and um, Japan. Um, so. I guess at the heart of it, I really believe in um, working from a place of values and intentionality. So that if you don't, um, and so the, the concept of cultural equity, um, diversity, and you know, we do struggle with language, particularly here in the United States, about you know, and we can get bogged down in language. So um, that it is embedded in NPN structure and um, in our um, mission statement and our um, bylaws and how we organize ourselves. And it's, um, so the intentionality of um, supporting multiple voices and different perspectives within the context of an, uh, an organization. And we are a limited, intentionally a limited, limited network um, and in our work around the globe, um, we are we have a decentralized decision making process. I mean, that's one of the, the value. The national office is not the one making the choices, um, but we are supporting um, our members who we have been able to structure to be represent a, a, a lot of multiple voices and perspectives. And I would add, just in terms of the diversity definition, that geography is. Um, also a major aspect of it. So just as a simple example, working in Latin America and the Caribbean, several of the countries there, um, Brazil notably, have very strong art supportive infrastructures. In Central America and the Caribbean, um, that is not the case. So how we can address geographic diversity if we really want to work with those regions of the world and not fall back on um, <coughs> constantly working with artists from Brazil or identifying presenters from Brazil to host U.S. artists because there's money there. And I think money, the, fa the money factor of being willing to spend your money in places where um, you're not going to be, where there isn't a lot of money. And I think that is also one of the economic drivers is another layer of the complexity of, of it all. So I go back to intentionality that if, if this is something you want to achieve, then you've got to think through your systems and analyze your systems and understand the context in which you're working and apply that analysis to your structures. So, maybe I should add some, because uh, I'm from a completely different perspective. Uh, I'm from the right back from Sweden, um, and I'm a little bit afraid of speaking. You're not blonde. This is the first time I've heard that. <laughs> um, no, I find it very interesting sitting here listening and also taking my time before speaking because I'm quite afraid of speaking English because it's not my mother tongue. It's already it's 
comes a question of language. I very clearly hear the Swedishness in my voice, and that's very painful because I grew up thinking that I would, I grew up learning English, dreaming of becoming a Swedish rapper. And so I had this idea that I would open my mouth and sound like Snoop. Thank you a lot to say that. <laughs> but I would try to make myself heard and understood. Um, but um, I was born and raised in Sweden, and my father's from Tunisia. And, and I, I, I write a lot about Sweden's history, and especially I thought it was interesting what you said about the idea of perceived homogeneity. I'm sorry, I can't say, say that word. But, um, because that, I come from a place where we invest a lot of political capital in trying to defend the idea that we were once homogeneous and not, now we are not. And of course, that, if that's the basic idea that we um, allow for us to believe in, that uh, a lot of political, quite dangerous uh, uh, consequences arise. Because one, between one third and one fourth of our population left our country to the states. That's not a part of our um, how do you, nationalistic myth, for example. You know, there are a lot of stories being told in our country, and I can only speak from the Swedish perspective because I'm a Swede. Um, that, but there are a lot of stories that are not, um, you know, matching this myth, and therefore they become forgotten or untold. Uh, so I think I, as a writer, I write plays and novels, and I tend to try to break free from these kind of dichotomies that we are discussing here with the use of language. And sometimes it works, and many times it doesn't work. Uh, but I thought it was super interesting to hear about quality, because I think that in, in Sweden, quality has been used as a way to um, give, um, I don't know what you would say, like uh, give a space to um, um, groups that was all, where the, the um, with uh, the, uh, the word, um, quality was used as a way to give space for some groups, but never giving them the possibility to um, uh, be there on equal terms. I'm sorry if I'm not, uh, if I'm not using the right words or something. But I think that's super interesting. But just the concept of uh, from a uh, feminist perspective, that's how a lot of plays, for example, in theater, were they, uh, female playwrights were invited, but they were never invited to the big stage. They were invited to be within the feminist framework, or they would create like a subculture of feminist plays. Or um, we had in Sweden in 2009, we had um, like a multicultural year where all of a sudden non blonde Swedes, because we exist, <laughs> were invited to a number of cultural institutions. But did that really change anything? I'm not sure because every, everyone was invited um, with the idea that they had to represent the majority society's idea of who they were. And it, it didn't amount to very interesting work because um, it's impossible to enter into a frame where your whole uh, existence is being determined by someone else. Um, so I think that what I'm trying to do is to break free of these dichotomies, and especially in my country, the dichotomy between um, uh, who is a part of mass society and who is not is very strong, and I think that we can all relate to this from different types of perspectives. Um, in, in Sweden, we have immigrants and non-immigrants, Swede and non-Swede. Yeah, yeah. 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 And, and this, is, this is the interesting thing, how to break free from I think that I try to use language, and I think I try to use confusion as a tool. Um, my first play that was produced in, in Sweden, but then it brought over to New York by the play company, started off with um, a very historic play. I took an old play by a romantic um, 19th century playwright called Carl Jonas Luba Arnquist, and I took his words and I put them on stage. And it's super boring and no one understands anything. It's just very, very boring theater. And this is a very old trick, but uh, then I had two actors hidden in the audience that started commenting on the play and just started discussing the fact that it was impossible to understand. <laughs> uh, and what did the rest of the audience do? Well, they defended the history, even though it was too tricky to understand. I mean, I, I'm not sure, I'm still not sure what it says uh, in that original play, but it was very historic and it was a real play. You know, as plays should be written. 
And in Sweden, that in that, that, those small seconds of confusion, not really being sure of where the boundary was between audience and spectator, or uh, between uh, actor or, or listener, that those small seconds, when it worked, it was super interesting to see how people went from the first moments of like trying to hush them, trying to tell them you have to respect the theater, you know, uh, uh, but also very quickly turning into very aggressive and um, uh, harsh racist slurs. Um, uh, stop with this immigrant buffoonery, or you know, like because these guys were Swedish, but they were not. Ah, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but the interesting thing was also in Sweden that created one reaction. In Germany, another reaction. In I, uh, uh, in France, it was like a fist fight. <laughs> <laughs> and in the States, I, I was sure we were talking to Kate for a lot about this. Like, I, I was sure that the New York audience would be so uh, unbaffled because they've seen this in many times. And we, we won't get any reaction. But then the play was put up in, well, it was actually put up in, in Tribeca, very, not too far from, from uh, uh, World, uh, World Trade Center. And I didn't think about that. That also created another, uh, took another cultural world or another cultural uh, response. And I thought that no one would react to these people when they started uh, talking in the audience. And it was quite, quite violent at times. People were uh, very quick to defend defend the theater or the tradition or uh, Sometimes, at one point, I think someone tried to call the cops. Uh, I remember once when I was there, and I was a little bit, that was the first run through, there was one guy. The, the moment when someone said something to question what we perceived to be, you know, like the glue holding us together, uh, there was one guy getting up and just like, shut the fuck up! And being very aggressive to, um, and I thought that that, those moments of not being really sure where the voice is coming from. Um, of course, this is just the way to start off the play is dealing with identity and voice and representation. But just the second when you're not really sure, um, for me, that, that opens up a lot. Right. Well, if I may just cut in, I, I, I think it's an, uh, it's an interesting question of the artist's responsibility and its own question. I think in the United States, there has been a lot of um, demands put on the artists to have artist talks, to have artist statements, artists explain what it is that they are doing. And of course, being a dancer and also being black and looking the way I, I can, uh, the way I look, it's, it's um, I have to say, it's not so easy to create that kind of confusion. People see my body <laughs> and they're making up uh, their minds about what it is. Yeah, so, 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 so I think being black and moving is already a huge uh, thing that I am negotiating uh, from the moment I walk on, I walk onto the stage, yeah. and then the physical language that I am then, uh, you know, exploding, um, goes into some of these questions. Well, what is she doing? Is this theater? Or, you know, um, you know, start to um, sort of create confusion, but I think people are not happy with this confusion. Uh, there are a few intellectual, worldly people who love it, and maybe that's why I exist. But I think there are uh, more people who would <coughs> like to have just a straightforward, you know, t you know, put on your uh, brass skirt and bring the drum. Mm. And then I know what you're doing. <laughs> or, you know, uh, do square shapes. I know exactly what you're doing. This sort of in between places, I have to say, you know, um, I, I find that people are confused. And then, you know, the presenter will say, well, it's your job to go out there and then tell them what it is you're doing. Mm -hmm. um, and I have found that very, very oppressive because it also assumes that, you know, the, you, you know um, that the audience has no responsibility. What's that? Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, I, I, point to yeah. I think you point out something really, really interesting. This, um, it does get pushed more, increasingly every day. Uh, the responsibility for finding the money to produce the work, the out here, like everything. So promote everything. Yeah, and I think, and I think, and I, so I think you raise a really good issue. I think that, um, uh, yeah, yeah, I'm trying to, uh, you know. <laughs> um, but this idea of like the work presenting complications unto itself. Like I didn't get to see the last piece of crossing the line, but if we're in 
an actual box. Yes. And um, you know, I think that so I, I kinda wanted to turn this over to Barack a little bit because you have a longer series of presenters. And um, and um, because actually like like how do how does it present how are the presenters dropping the ball, if you will, in terms of like building context, building uh, expect helping the audiences have more knowledge when they come in about what to expect and seeking and, and contextualizing it so that you know you don't I mean it feels like there's actually a two-way street where the artists all of the obligation should be able to do a talk at that for the show, but actually there's work that needs to happen ahead of time, which is like, well this is how to look at this work if you've never seen it before. Or you know there are things that presenters could be doing. And I think there's a there's a lack of risk taken on the part of presenters, which is like, you know, they'll do the one really complicated work, but then they're worried about the box office, so they'll do a bunch of more familiar work so the audience that they're developing. And another piece is that when I worked at PS one for many years, like, you know, um, I'm trying to figure out how to say this. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Who's here? Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. At, different yeah. Time, at different times, different things would happen. So sometimes some artists would bring an audience that had a very different types of people in the audience, and sometimes you would have art that would only bring that audience to see it. So this idea of creating actually using, like you talked about the questioning the very like notion of what, you, like you question it by being in a box. You question it by having people talk to the audience. Artists are always questioning the assumptions of the physical space and the psychological assumptions of the space. Um, what so are you saying that it's called the box office assumption? Right, exactly. <laughs> that's because that's, we get paid from putting the people in boxes. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> so, 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 I'm sorry, how do you open it? From the presenters, okay. but it's like, but, but there does seem to be this, this thing, which is that the, the presenters don't do enough to question those assumptions, and that they don't do enough to create the actual physical space that's analogous to the aesthetic spaces that artists create, where you're actually physically putting people in hot juxtaposition with body different places, you know. And I just, I don't know. Just to touch on that, what you're saying, so I, I totally agree. I think that, uh, and I think that the, the reactions from in the small example that I just uh, that I just took from from my point is just I think that the reactions would be completely different if the not in, in this, from the Swedish context the um, the non-blondes would be on stage in the beginning and this, there would be like a blonde people in the, in the audience kind of questioning what was going on. Um, so I think that the, the question of body and how we relate to words and bodies, I think that's, that's, um, that's a very important point. Um, and, and also the, the people who were kind of being rebellious were linking to what you were said, they were quickly um, being <coughs> defined as outcasts because they didn't know immigrant but also class-wise. Because they did, they, did not follow the, um, they did not follow the conventions. Like, I, for example, uh, walking in here, I told one thing that one of the actors used to do. He used to bring a glass of water. And apparently in Swiss theater, you can't bring a glass of water. You have to put the water in a bottle. And I, well, that's a rule. That's a convention. <laughs> and the actor was just like, well, I'm very thirsty. And the guy, like, and the guardian said, no, no, you have to put it in a bottle. And just, I, I'm really thirsty. No, you have to put it in a bottle. And no one knew that this guy was an actor. And you should have seen the eyes that the rest of the audience used looking at this guy. It was just like, <sighs> <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 they're going to drink water. Also. <laughs> <laughs> it's just like, can I try and give a take of what you were going to say? Because what's quite interesting is that you probably did the play, but you wouldn't get the reaction that you did. Yeah. The natural fact, you did get the same kind of reaction. Yeah. It always ever function. Yeah. And so you have to think, yeah. well, what's underneath that? Mm. And for me, it's very interesting because we had a session at APAP yesterday, which was, it was not well attended, but it was a very interesting session, which is got on the of talent. But it wasn't very well, uh, um, it wasn't that great audience. It tells you something in it of itself about APAP, maybe. But, um, yes. It does. It has to be last year from Miami uh, Day. And a very interesting point. She said, what you have to understand is a lot of these arts institutions were part of nation building. Yes. Yeah? 
Now, if you look at England, or you can look at the United States, or you can probably give a people Brazil, or whatever, or, or wherever, it doesn't matter, wherever it's a nation state. The question of culture and nation is a very, very powerful, there's a very, very powerful link. So, for example, Catherine said yesterday that you have to realize that all these great big institutions that we have in America were founded so Americans could say, and I'm quoting her, that we are a civilized, that we're a civilized nation. So we build a opera house, we build theatre, when we have Shakespeare, dot, 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 dot. And really, what's happening there is what Benedict Anderson, the philosopher, called, is you're constructing an imagined community. Now, the problem is, that, that beginnings of a nation state, the problem is, and the institutions which are reflected in that nation building, is that they're exclusive. So therefore, at the beginning of a nation, actually, there's some people who are citizens, and some people who clearly aren't citizens. That's clear in American context, in terms of slavery and, and, and so on and And it's actually clear in a, in a British context, I would say, in terms of class, for example. So, in some sense, what you're doing is you're challenging, I think, you're challenging that notion of the, of the direct relation between the nation state and cultural institutions. The cultural institutions really are there, and have been, at their birth, were there to try and create this imagined community. And in one sense, you'll disrupt that to imagine communities. So it doesn't really matter whether it's Paris, or it's New York, or it's London, whatever it is. The challenge, the the challenge, you're uncomfortable with this. The, the extreme reaction of your audience, or some members of your audience, is because you're challenging actually that whole notion of the relationship between culture and, and a nation state. Therefore, it seems to me, it arises the question, how do we, people around the table, the people in this room, how do we approach those institutions which were born for a particular purpose, which now we're kind of trying to wrest some kind of control over? How do we go about that without being incorporated into those institutions, assimilating them into those institutions, your outcomeness being jettisoned by the mother label putting things upon you or expectations of who you are? How do we, what do we do with those institutions? Do we have to tear them down? Um, do we have to infiltrate them? Or do we have to ignore them? And go off and do something else in, in places which is not about bricks and mortar. Things like bricks and mortar is there's always a key to the door. <laughs> Who holds the key to the door is the most powerful person. And that's clear, that's, and that's true. This building is a, is a museum of modern art. It's all about power. I think that might be also a good talk to the Japanese. Because, you know, yeah. I mean, I mean, the serious note, though, of that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, but, but, but I think. Oh, I'm sorry. Something you're just saying. I'm doing the table, by the way. Uh, something interesting to touch on that is that like, I'm a very young director, I'm much less distinguished than all of you. Um, director, writer, and theater. Um, and something that I've noticed is that there's a certain expectation that I will direct and write plays in theater like a white man, right? Like that's the expectation that people have of me. And they would like me to very much, they would like me very much to write plays, you know, with John, the you know, 30 year old janitor, and, and Mary. Um, you know, going about their business and having their relationships in this sort of context of the classical American canon that white writers are supposed to write and direct. Um, but I have a lot of friends who are black actors, Asian American actors, and the horrible thing I hear all the time is like, there are no rules. There are no rules for us because no one actually takes the time to write these rules. And when I sort of think about the institutions that, you know, you go on playbill.com, for example, and you try and apply to all of these large institutions that you think will start your career as a young person, um, it becomes quite clear quite quickly that that American can is specifically what they're looking for. So in the context of, you know, what do we do with these institutions and how do we circumvent sort of the problem of, you know, uh, how, how do you get past the gatekeeper, you know, I think a uh, response that I've settled on is one that you mentioned, is that you know, it probably is best at a certain point to go off and do something else to actually create an alternate space that hopefully what you can do is you can continue growing that space and that institutions over you know, a course of time will be forced to change along with that you know, because you're simply refusing to do something they expect you to do. You build something over a long period of time. And eventually that becomes the dominant form. 
that the institutions then have to come and get. Well, I, I, I think life is short, really. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> these institutions uh, have been, you know, going on for 400 years. I mean, some of them. Um, I, I feel really, and uh, maybe this is part of my uh, growing up in the revolutionary in Zimbabwe, is get in there and, and, and decorate the thing from good stuff. <laughs> I want to be on the proceeding stage. I feel like my work um, would not count unless it's on a certain stage. Yes. You know, I can't do it under the table in my house in a lock somewhere. It doesn't matter. It matters that it is at band. It matters that it is at, at hall of stages. It matters that it is at places where uh, the power is. Yes, I want to be where the power is, but I, I am not willing to jettison my Africanness. Oh, my uh, class, <laughs> you know, oh, lack of it, um, you know, once I get there. So I'm not willing to compromise. And I find that, you know, it is uh, people who look more like me that are perhaps, oh, less supportive. You know, like they're more traumatized. Like you, now you're going to get there and you're going to embarrass us by doing that. You know, so it's right to go right now. First of all, as um, Andy said, and I've been doing this a long time, <laughs> I'm older than some of the institutions we're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> um, I've worked in many contexts all over the country, <coughs> from Detroit to Atlanta to Houston, Texas. San Francisco, California, to New York City, and now New Jersey. Not only have I been doing it a long time, but I'm blessed to say, like my dear colleague MK, I've also been blessed to work all over the world. I've worked in Europe, I've worked in Africa, I've worked all over Asia, North and South America. <laughs> and I've been hearing these conversations for a long, <laughs> and I'm not going to lie, sometimes I get tired of these conversations. I wasn't going to do this, but I had a wonderful opportunity to meet um, Hassan and BK last year. And it kind of re inspired me to jump back into the fray. <laughs> and then I had a great conversation on the phone with Andy. And he pushed me over the edge. <laughs> <laughs> There's a hundred pound, oh, I also might say, in addition to all the geographical places that I've worked, I've also worked in many different contexts. My first job in the arts, I've worked for an organization that had a staff of two and a half people. The half person was on drugs and actually died in the and so you learned it was probably the best experience I had ever had because you had to do everything. You had to write the press release, you had to run to the airport and get the artist from the airport. You had, I, had to sweep out the, um, I had to sweep out the facility and turn, change the toilet paper. I had to write the grants, I had to do the contracts. And then the last job I had, and I'm not saying this to brag or boast, but I'm just giving you the context. Was New Jersey Performing Arts Center, many people do not know, is the sixth largest institution in the United States. It's a $180 million facility. It has an annual budget of $26 million. It has a staff of over 100 people. And the board sits around like tables like this and says, I'll give a million dollars to NJ Pat if you give a million dollars to the city. That's the context. So I'd like to start by saying there's not a 100, 200, 300, 400, 500, there's a 700 pound gorilla sitting in the that we don't talk about. And the context that I want to start with is race and racism. Because we would not be sitting here in this room. We would not be talking about diversity 
we would not be talking about multiculturalism if it wasn't for the fact of racism. And the problem I have is that we don't talk about it because all of us come together and think, well, because I work in the arts, we're so enlightened and noble and liberal. We don't have to talk about race. Aren't we tired of that conversation? But we wouldn't be having this conversation if we weren't talking about 400 years ago. If we weren't talking about when people literally thought that people were buffoon. Not just words they threw out. They literally thought people were animals. So, going to your point, let's talk about language. Let's clean that up first. Let's clean that up first. And as some of you heard it, you've heard me speak before, I think you forgive me if I'm repeating. But there's a list, and I want you to take out pen and paper if you have it. And as I always say, take these words from your vocabulary. The first one we're going to start with is non-white. And I hear it. Yeah, you say yes, but I hear it all the time. I see it in grant writing. I see it in marketing materials. Somebody said it on a panel that I was on, <laughs> talking about diversity, and referred to herself as non-white. So let's clean up the language first of all. All right, so non-white is off the list. Minority is off the list. Okay, because we use minority to lump all the African and African American and Caribbean people and the Asian American and the Asian, because we are not the minority, we're the majority. I heard, I was at the think tank the other day and somebody said, well, you know, the demographics have shifted. And I said, hell if they are, they have shifted. Yeah. yeah. Oh, we are too. <laughs> <laughs> the demographics are not shifting, they have shifted. Okay, so let's acknowledge that. Take multiculturalism out of your vocabulary. I'm so sorry. <laughs> <laughs> because multiculturalism became the euphemism for minority, and those of us said, we don't want to be called a minority. Take multiculturalism off your grants, off your marketing materials, off of the way you describe yourselves. I am not multicultural. I decide who I am my definitions. My mother did not have a college education, but you know what she taught me? And it's not about being politically correct. It's about asking people, who are you? That's what we're really talking about. How do you define yourself, as Nora often speaks about? OK, so language, as you mentioned. All right, so let's go to diversity. And let me just say, it's, as I said earlier, it's not a new conversation, it's an old conversation. And so I don't want to just keep browsing you people talking about the same things over and over, which I often do. Just buy this book. <laughs> and this was written almost 30 years ago. And it should be in everybody's library. How many of you know who Dr. Martin Moran is? All right, if you don't know, it's a problem. Because you can't talk about diversity. I heard someone say recently, I'm going to, oh, it's when we were at that conversation last year, the woke conversation. And somebody raised their hand, well, I'm going to the first diversity conference in the United States. And I had to raise my hand and say, no, you're not. <laughs> Because the first diversity conference I went to was 25 years ago. And it was organized by this woman. And she taught many of the folks, whoever not in this room, should be. Dr. Martha Lorena Vega is the editor of Voices from the Battlefront. That should tell you something. <laughs> Achieving cultural equity. 
Voices from the Battle for Achieving Cultural Equity. So the problem with diversity and multiculturalism and all those other words is that it's still about the other. It's still about, well, how do we get the, and once again, I'm just using the labels that other people use. How do we get the black people in? How do we get their audience, is what we're usually saying. How do we get the Asian people in? Which really means how we get their audience in. <coughs> how do we get them to buy tickets? How do we save our organizations with the colored people? And so the other word you're going to take off your list is people of color. <laughs> Stop putting it in your grants. Stop putting it in your marketing materials. Everybody has color. Andy has color. <laughs> Brad has color. MK has color. We are all people of color, so stop using it to refer to anybody. The other word you're going to take off your list is ethnicity, because we use that now as a euphemism for race, because we don't want to talk about race. It's too scary. It's too big. It's too somebody might fist fight. Somebody might, and believe me, I can fist fight. <laughs> Voices from the battle from we've been fist fighting a long time. So then we will take this conversation to what Hassan and me. And what somebody, and what, I'm sorry, say your name. Sam. Sam. So, because there were people who were gatekeepers, who had the power, diversity in this country became people who created their own spaces. Whether it was a dear friend and colleague, Dudley Cock from Apple Shop. If you don't know that organization, write it down. These are your history makers. These are the folks that have been doing the work in this country until they don't even come to this shit anymore. You understand? Apple Shop, Dudley Cobb, Mark Lorena Vega, the Caribbean Cultural Center. Alternate roots. Alternate, Alternate roots. roots. Alternate roots in Atlanta, Georgia. These are our legends, and we don't even know their names. We don't know who they are. We don't know what they've written, what they've said, and they don't bother, I'll say it again, they don't bother to come to this shit anymore. They are tired, <coughs> and well, they should. Because they have been on the battlefront, and they have been in the trenches for a long time. So they created the alternate spaces. Phyllis Farza and, uh, who am I trying to say? Hey, I took a casino in California. Write it down if you don't know who they are. Yeah, I took a casino. John O'Neill, June Buck Theater in Louisiana. You need to know who these people are because they created the alternate spaces that made people in this country at least recognize that there were other art forms and other people out there creating incredible art. And going back to this issue of quality, culture knows. Wait, how do I usually say this? I haven't said it in a long time. Excellence knows no cultural boundaries. <laughs> Excellence knows no cultural boundaries. The problem it is, is we don't know excellence. We don't know what's excellent in Zimbabwe. We don't know what is excellent in South Korea. We don't know what the aesthetic standards are in most other cultures and countries that we claim to work in. And that goes to my next point, which is, and everybody hears me say this, then they start to groan, but we talk about it all the time, research. Our field does not do fucking research. Oh, I forgot we were speaking about I am so sorry. <laughs> we do not do research. What are you reading? What
what are you studying before I present an artist? I don't accept press packages. I don't accept DVDs. I don't accept CDs. If I want to know an artist, I go and see them. And I mean around the world. I find somebody who's going to give me some money to get wherever I need to go to see the artist that I need to see before I put them on stage. It's called research. And not only do I read and learn about the artists, I read about their culture. I read about their historical context. When I go to Israel, I know the history of Israel. When I go to South Korea, I know the history of South Korea. I know the history, the culture, the various religions in that country. What's the religious and spiritual context that the artist is working in? Not even just the political, the social, and the cultural context. We don't do our own. You hear me? Don't do our homework. Deep listening. I know, I'm sorry, I'm almost there. I don't know if I work for Deep listening. Shut up. <laughs> <laughs> Shut up. <coughs> and listen. Okay. Last but not least, I think. <laughs> is I'm also going to ask you. I, this just came to me this week because I said I've been participating in the APAC thing, think tank. The challenge. Someone said, "Oh, we do diversity. We're very welcoming. We give access." Said, oh, access has to be taken out of vocabulary. Because <laughs> access isn't enough. Access goes back to, you said it first, the gatekeepers, the damn gatekeepers. No, what we're trying to do is not keep the gate, not give the access. That's like giving somebody their freedom. You can't give somebody their freedom. What we're trying to do is as much as possible empower, but even that assumes that I have the power or someone else has the power and you're giving power. So the word that I want you to put right down that takes that substitutes for all of these is share. Share. S-H-A-R-E. <laughs> share. When I share, to say share, I mean share back. Share ideas. Share information. Share power. Share privilege. Share money. Well, I'm not done. I'm letting people write. <laughs> share resources. Share money, yes. And resources and money are two different things. And I learned that doing Africa Exchange. When the Ford Foundation gave me a uh, multi million dollar grant to work with artists from the African continent, and do you know Suleiman Kohli? Yeah. Yes. Suleiman Kohli walked in the door and said, Ford Foundation didn't ask me if I wanted to collaborate with U.S. artists. He said, you Americans, you come around with all the money, and you think you have all the resources. I have the resources. I have creativity. Going back to the creative case. I have creativity. I have a mind. I have imagination. I have a gift. Those are my resources. If you really want to give me something, give me a piano, because that's what I really need. <laughs> I need to work with Americans. I need a piano. <laughs> so the last thing I want to say about share is share with all the people all the time. Share with all the people all the time. That is diversity. And I'm done. Somebody else.
<laughs> Nobody wants to share it all. It's the, it's the, I mean, I think it's such a long mystery of life. It's mine. Oh, God, but everything but it's us. All mine. It's us. But it's also, again, that the us. system of paternalism, colonialism, right, of people feeling inferior or being made, you know, not All right, folks, listen to this. So you got to see it. You got to see it. You got to see the book I call held up is called, oh, wait a minute, wait a minute, even, 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 forgive me, I, I hate to sound like a teacher, but I just, let me just find this right quick, because I know where it is, and I want to read this to you. You know what I tell people? I don't mean to sound arrogant, but the, I have to say the arrogance comes from being in the battlefield. The arrogance comes from having fought the fight. <laughs> I don't do the wringing of the, of the hands and the woes. I don't whine. I don't whine. I do. I figure it out. I dot my eyes and I cross my teeth. I can probably count on two hands the number of times I've been turned down for a grant. Because you know why? I'm always trying to think ahead of any funder I have ever met. I'm always thinking ahead. And that comes once again from deep listening. So I just have to read you this. Oh, man. I just, after I participated in this APAC think tank. <laughs> well, well, I just find it. Okay. Okay. You know, I think it's interesting, like, calling the deep listening institute is Pauli Vera, Paul Vera. So there's actually like, an aesthetic thing about sort of the yes. nature of attention and listening. But one of the things is that I think that one of the you know, sharing is actually, um, we live now in, in 2000, you know, someone said mentioning uh, moving beyond uh, dichotomies. And I think that that's really what's interesting, I think, to me now, is that we actually are sort of, the challenge is to sort of actually think um, beyond oppositional structures and binaries. And as we move into a more fully, like, network digital world, um, and things become more horizontal and less vertical, how do we then behave in ways that, that do that? So I think that like, it actually, like, like I think that like, it's not necessarily not participating with the institutions, it's like it's both. Mm -hmm. you know, yes. It's about building alternate structures. I mean, it's, it, it, yeah, I have one way of doing something. Don't, the thing is, don't kid yourself. You have to think, you have to, you have to, um, you have to stretch the around this question. You know, I think it's very difficult. You're an illusion, you're an individual artist. Or trying to negotiate with big institution, they will swallow you up. Right? You have to have some kind of power base. You have to have a network. You have to have a horizontal well, network. That's the you network. Know, right? it's, it's, it's pure, it's pure. It's like when you look at like like before they shut down Napster, you know, yeah. like like it's peer to peer yeah. is really the key. And I think mean, I mean, to get into the institution, I, I, this is what I think is an interesting challenge. Like, you know, I live outside the institution I used to and then I got kicked out, you know? But I have friends in that let us come and do this. And, you know, and it's like, it's like sort of super old commie cell structure stuff, you know? And I never have fortunately, or unfortunately, not lived in a, rep, in a culture that's experienced a revolution. So I don't, I'm grateful on one, on a huge level. On another level, living in an area that maybe we need some more change in. Um, a lot. But, but I do wonder about like, like, well, what is the power of our peer networks? And what is the way of sort of like, you know, how do we build those networks of people that have like minds that are that are decentralized and unstructured yes. and oh, are changed in the conversation? Yes. Yeah. Yes. You know, yes. and, 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 if, or you know, not. And, and how do we do that in terms of capital? You know, because I think one of the things that like this is a super place of privilege, but um, you know, because Europe has funded so much work in America, uh, and particularly coming from New York historically, like the aesthetic biases have shown up, right? So uh, New York artists make work that Europe wants, rather than making work that is actually reflective of what it's like to be an American artist. And I think that happens in general, wherever, you talk about Brazil, like wherever the money is, that determines the aesthetic biases. And I, I, one of the things that I wonder is like peer-to-peer -peer artist conversations, peer-to-peer -peer writer conversations, how do we use the new network world to build peer-to-peer -peer networks that allow us to change those conversations to actively resist the sort of dominant aesthetic, like, you know, 
I don't know what the word is. That's only a, let me just say, it's not an either or conversation. Just like we were talking about, I love what Laura said about, I want to be a thing. Yes. I want to be a, where the power is. But I also love what you said about, I'm going to build my own alternative institution. It's not either or, it's both and. And all of us in here, that's why I get started with the tools, the words, because the words are the first tool, the first way that we organize ourselves. Because Mar this is what Mark Vega taught me. First, let's organize ourselves around the language. Let's start talking the same language so that we know what we're talking about. But on a global level, that's really hard, because Jonah right. said it very well. Like, English isn't this first language, and like, that was, like, when I was in Berlin, it was amazing. You don't understand what I'm talking about. They have to, if, if, if Swedish or in Netherlands, they have to still the same. Issue of them. So non-white minority, yeah. that all of tone in the Netherlands. I mean, yeah. it's the same. It's like, there's certain things that in every language, in every country, they mean the same thing. thing. Scrap, and mean the same thing. But Maybe but, with a different history, but there are. Well, but, but I guess what I meant is like in talking to each other. Like I mean, my you know my personal experience is that sometimes you think you're having a conversation with somebody and you realize you're having a totally different conversation yes. because yes. my Spanish is terrible and their English is terrible. Or it's you know, even, or it's even within the field itself. Yeah, it's, yeah. It's not even across languages. I mean, I was at the uh, a showcase for a youth theater, and in the Netherlands, it's, it's, it's quite a strong, uh, a strong institution, youth theater. And it's doing very well internationally. And the people that started that, they were now saying with all the cutbacks in the Netherlands, they were fighting for the houses, literally actually, the houses they built. The young ladies were sort of saying, but we're not, we don't need those houses. We're not working in those houses. Right? So it's already there is the, the difference in the conversation. And I think, and it comes back to the vertical and the horizontal. Um, uh, okay, but I'm that old, but I already feel in all the sense that when I see the new generation, even the students that I work with, the new generation, they are not thinking vertically yet. They right. are so used to think horizontally. Yes. And I think we are the ones that cannot keep up with them. Right? But I don't believe that. I'm sorry. Uh, you know, we're talking about what, we keep talking about what doesn't work. Somebody here is a gatekeeper and they won't let me in. I, you know, talking to somebody from Brazil. I mean, look folks, we, in case you don't know it, <laughs> first of all, I'm anointing all of you as smart people. I'm anointing all of you as creative people. We are smart enough <clears throat> to figure out our problems. We are smart enough to change other people who don't think like us. We are smart enough and creative enough to do our work no matter what the obstacles are. We are smart enough and creative enough to do our work even though people are calling us buffoons. It's not the people who are calling us buffoons that are going to win people. It is not. I don't care what you think. I don't care what it looks like. Those are not the people who are going to win. We are going to win. And if you are afraid, then get behind somebody who's not. And just follow in their footsteps. OK, so let me just finish. <laughs> <laughs> See, now you make me lose again. <laughs> OK, you are going to wait. <laughs> You're going to wait until I find this again. I'm not going to All right. Here's to the crazy ones, the misfits, the rebels, the troublemakers, the round pegs and the square holes, the ones who see things differently. They're not fond of rules, and they have no respect for the status quo. You can quote them, disagree with them, glorify them, vilify them, but the only thing you can't they do is ignore them because they change things. They push the human race forward. And while some of them may seem like they're crazy, we see genius. <laughs> because the people who are crazy enough to think that they can change the world are the ones who do. I'm going to repeat that again. <laughs> the people who are crazy enough 
to think they can change the world are the ones who do. And now I'm really good. <laughs> <laughs> uh, thank you. Uh, to go back to what you did earlier, I think we, we already won. Um, and I, I actually think the conversation we're having is not about pandering. I think it's more about strategy and thinking. I think, you know, the, the, the demographics have already changed in the United States. The awareness that the world is more complicated and not a limited narrative has already shifted. It's more about, I think, us strategizing, knowing that the sort of legacy structures are slow to move and slow to change. How are we, as the interim, who are already living in the world as it is, you know, deal with that? Right. 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 Yeah. The so, world is changing. Yeah, everything is changing. So it's also important. Well, I, I think, like, I'm sure you guys know that I'm not sure um, and that's true, what you just said, is that that happening um, act of, you know, in 1988, 59% of people with white people voted for the wrong number of candidates who were looking for the election. 2012, 59% of white people voted for the wrong number of people who were looking for the and the Republicans lost the election. That's the future. That's the future. And that has arrived. And it's going to be the shared value of the shared but it's, no, it's oppositional, sorry Barack, but it's still, it's still, there's still opposition in this country. It's going to be people of color are taking over. They're going to take over. There's more of them. They, they, they need to organize. It needs to be, they can't just, because they're, they're all in different places. But I thought, but, but I, 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 I said it's still, still, still not first. We don't place the other. It is still not And then I don't lose yourself. We don't lose yourself. But we don't want to go the creative case for diversity, that's what I think is so powerful, and what we as artists can be so powerful in, is it's not thinking in the us versus them. I mean, yes, it's out there, mm -hmm. but by us, if us equals them, and our work, that's what you guys, are, that's why I'm kind of curious also to find out what you guys discovered there, is that, uh, you know, creativity in itself asks for diversity. Yeah. So it's, it's not, it's, I kind of don't want to talk about race and about all this other stuff because I think it's much more intrinsic in what unbalance. Like I want to talk not about diversity, but about like no balance, for example, and or, or, or uh, dissonance. That's more about that's, that's more about artists. Do you represent community or do you revolt against you? Yeah, but yeah, I, I think that's also the community. I think that's the entire muscle. Is is I actually think that like what artists do, like well they do all kinds of stuff. But right. I feel like the act of like participating in art, even as an audience member, like being in the audience is participation. And I think what we're doing is, and this goes back even like you know, the sixties, Athens, and many countries, is that we're, we're actually sort of building model communities, like little temporary, transitional, temporary autonomous zones that, that sort of like hopefully model the world that we believe the way it is. So when I you know come to witness Nora's work, you know, I'm participating in this micro world that of possibility. She's performing possibility and, and helping me move my mind to a more expansive place. And and when I listen to jazz, you know, um, like really free jazz, I'm being called to enter this psychological aesthetic space that is open to possibility and, and mistake and error, but is beautiful for the flaws and for the liveness. When I, you know, so I think that like, like certainly that to almost maybe like a bigger idea in, in society is it comes back to fear. I think. Yeah. But it's like in order to be open to that jazz and in order to be open to that dissonance, you need to be fearless. And I think as artists, generally, we are fearless people. And that's a value you need to get out into the world because how does power work? It still is fear. I think it's the same. It is about value. It is about idea. It's not just about transition of one rooting group to another rooting group. I mean, if you look at South Africa, you see the experience of that. Actually, the replacing of uh, a, a white activist. I mean, you can, you can argue about what is the economic nature who holds all power in South Africa. But transition between a, 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 a white capitalist system to a black capitalist system, actually, you know, that whole debate came up around the, around the death of Mandela. Actually, from my viewpoint in the United Kingdom, actually, Obama, for us, 
would be a great disappointment in terms of, in terms of how actually he hasn't fulfilled the promise uh, around the question of, uh, of race, for example, let alone the question of economics. But how could you possibly have done that? Well, no, 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 yes, because exactly, isn't that the point? Isn't that the point? Because actually, in the run-up to situation, I remember I used to get to my inbox because I signed up to take this thing. This, there was this mass movement beginning to arise around uh, about, which is a question of network. I'm on right? that, I was also on that, of course, you know, you to be on that. No, no, I'm not criticizing my network. I'm not concerned about that. I'm concerned about that. I don't think anyone will get up there. No, he's a man. He's a man. I'm a man. You're, we're all people. We're all criticizable. But there's no God out there. And if you think that's a good in, in, in human term, if you think that's a good thing, you're, you're, you've got a problem. Because you will put your faith in someone who will also betray you. Clearly. But it's a question of ideas. It's a question of structure. It's a question of power. It's a question of how you organize yourself. It's a question of how you model the future today. So in terms of spaces and things like that. It is around the question of ideas, it is not around the question of transition between one group of people to another group of people, because actually the majority of people will not feel the change. And as a, as a, a socially committed artist, which is what I am at my heart, actually, that's what I'm interested in. That's really what I'm interested in. So I think we have to go beyond these surface of social. We have to think a little bit deeper to transform well, I'm, I'm, it. I'm I'm curious why there aren't more African immigrants that come to see my work. I mean, that's something that, that I'm really, really uh, fascinated by, you know. Why is it they cannot come and see my work? So the whole questions of economics, and, you know, time factors, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. And, and, and what is my role in that? How do I get to those people? Okay, now living in Brooklyn, do I go to every single bar and go, hey, I'm Boris Brother, please come and see my work? I mean, I, I feel like, you know, uh, that uh, my work is, is complex. Fine, I think I'm, I, I'm, I'm engaging with as much vigor as I possibly could, but I am still not able to draw people who the institutions want to be able to draw. So what, what, what's, what's, what's missing? What's missing? And I feel like this, this is some of the frustration I feel in this kind of conversation is that, from you a, know. From a presenter's perspective, I, I can tell you, I, I, will, I will share my experience. Um, and I have seen this happen with cultural agencies here, is that people who immigrate to America um, tend to, I've seen this in multiple populations in South Africa, um, and like for instance, the, the, like some countries will support um, contemporary work that investigates the sort of like challenges of sort of identity um, and comes from that place. A lot of the communities here want work that reminds them of, that is familiar from the place that they came from. It's idealized, nostalgic. I mean, yeah, that's Caribbean. Yeah, well, I mean, even, like, <laughs> even in Jewish history, it's like, Jews yeah. like to go to see the wrong group. It has no bearing whatsoever on the actual truth of the human experience. But they want to go see this idealized thing they've been seeing it for 50 years. And I think that, like, like, like uh, the Portuguese, I, I talked to Portuguese artists who are like, my, Embassy only funds Fada, you know, because they don't want to see my contemporary work. Like I think that like what you're discussing is actually a big, which is which is a bigger issue, which is when we live in a world where immigration and di diaspora, whatever that means, is actually a condition that most people share. How does an artist? But I think until that changes, then the question of power and the kind of that we're free to do the work that 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 we really want to imagine because we're not being ambassadors. Oh, you know, the yeah, one no, African. It's not about you because it's in it. We yeah, we went to East. We me and East. I went to East and Malik went there. We're eating in the African um, canteen last night, and that's where your audience. But what about all the, the point was? I ate in the canteen for five dollars, and then they got their taxi. And the whole of the street is basically yellow cabs. That's where your audience is. I mean, I'm not saying you should go there and dance there, but that's where your that's where your audience is. And the notion that they can make the leap um, between that eatery and uh, one of our institutions to come to see you. But I think that's, that's, that's a question for the institutions. They need to be able to also identify those immigrants have money. They, you know, they they want to see things. They also need, you know, yeah, their yeah. So, so but, but I also think it's about we as we talk about contemporary work and new ideas. Is that you know, in general, people new ideas there is, and I think in all culture, 
anything that's new that's sent out that is crazy, that is different, that is not what attracts the people. So maybe as a pioneer in the world, or a seer, or somebody who's true to itself, which is already, already is a daring endeavor, there are not many people curious whether efforts or anything will be attracted. But uh, maybe, maybe but the key, the key. Uh, <laughs> 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 I just want to say this, because I want to echo the sharing. I'm from, I'm based in Amsterdam. I'm from Amsterdam. Uh, we have this uh, venue and nothing house called MC. And it's so difficult because uh, uh, for almost 30 years we were funded uh, structurally by the, by the government and the city council. Uh, but we got out last year purposely. <laughs> and the reason why we did that is that we wanted to by our own uh, uh, state, our own being. Uh, and in order to do this, we, we created our own institution, you might say. And uh, in which, in which in we started to, uh, uh, to have sharing as our main goal. So what, 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 what did we do last year? We, um, uh, uh, developed our own, organized our own um, <coughs> conference. It, it was called Right About Now. And um, we decided that the purpose of this, um, of this conference should be celebrating, celebrating ideas, celebrating views, uh, 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 celebrating perspective. In order, uh, the other way around, uh, all these conferences I've been to is always talking about, it's always has to do uh, uh, about the problems we, we are dealing with. But what about the celebration? What about, you know, um, uh, uh, celebrating uh, uh, the, the, our own uh, people like, people like what you would say, the book, the, the book you were talking about. Yes, pioneers. You know, it's a great way to battle the present. Really, really. You know, to connect with uh, uh, professional development, uh, uh, with young artists, emerging artists, and connect them with these, I call them icons, my masters, and celebrate what we have done already up until now. I know I agree. And, and, and you know, it's a really powerful tool of empowerment, and uh, I, I really believe that we, this is something I, is, that's lacking now in the discussion about uh, yeah. cultural diversity. There's something really important. I talked about deep listening. You did not hear what I said. I didn't say the conversation should be about race. I said the context is race. If you don't want to talk about race, you should not talk about race, but that is not what I said, so I want to clarify oh, that. I wasn't referring to okay, your so, the context is friends, not the necessarily the conversation. Let's also stop creating the other. We're also creating the other in this conversation right now. So those presenters, those gatekeepers, those this, that we are all in this together. And one of the things I often say about diversity is if you're just putting people on a stage, that is not diversity. Okay, let's be very clear. That's why I said my real definition of diversity is sharing. Mm -hmm. But if you're just putting people on a stage, for those of us who are presenters, that is not diversity. So let's talk just about from a presenter's point of view, and then I want to get to uh, Nora's point. Okay, folks, if your programming is already diverse, because most of us have figured out how to do that, if your programming is already diverse, then your board should be diverse. Yes. If your board is already diverse, make your staff diverse. If your staff is not is already diverse, make your creative partnerships diverse. If your creative partnerships are diverse, make your cross-sector relationships diverse. What do I mean by cross-sector? Nobody knows what cross-sector means. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Okay, but I was in a conference where somebody didn't know what cross-sector was, so I'm just making sure. 
Why are we working with people in the military? Why are we keep working with people who are reporting? Why are we working with people in the health profession? Why are we working with biologists? Why are we working with, I could go for a whole host of lists, because it has to be an inclusive. We can't sit here and make everybody else the other. Because we will sit here and like this sister just said, whispering in my ear, we are preaching to the choir and talking to ourselves. <laughs> we get tired of preaching to the choir because going back to the son's first point, deep listening, I know we need to take notes because we don't listen well. Diversity is not just the color of people's skin. Diversity is all the people, all the time. Diversity is all the people, all the time. And sharing. And going back to Nora's point about, like, how do, uh, oh God, just, I want to, I want to, I want to, I want to, oh, 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 people, yes. Okay, so we're talking about us having the power. When somebody says, I just heard somebody that did this. Oh, this was me. In New Orleans, who's a colleague with MK, they were presenting Kyle Abraham. Does anybody not know who Kyle Abraham is? Choreographer, did I write it down? He just got his MacArthur Genius Fellowship. He was presenting at the New Orleans Contemporary Art Center. And the marketing director said, I don't know anything about this choreographer. I can't sell the tickets. And he said, not a problem. Then you only get half your salary this month. <laughs> Hello? You need to go in like Bill T. Jones used to do and say, this is who I want at this performance. I want people that look like me, or I don't want anybody that looks like me. I want people there from the military. I want people from the church down the street. Because if there's a presenter who wants you in your space, then in their space, then you have the power. And don't forget it. You have the power. But there are artists who think they don't. I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to, you do have the power, but we got to go. So thank you very much. Check out the bios. Power around. Stop you soon. Keep it going. You have the power.